two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with Mark and James. We've just been discussing off air what pills we should take to help us live our lives. Legal. Legal pills, yes. I need something to keep me awake. Um, young children waking me up at all hours. Um, yeah, definitely. Need well, the public school boy says uh, magnesium to help you uh, sleep. School boy, that helps you sleep. But yeah, but that also would help you stay awake during the day. He's off camera, I shouldn't talk to That's him. That's John. You can stand over those... here, John. Can stand, put yourself in. No yeah. one wants that. No one wants no, that. We no. don't need that. Um, look, we can't talk too much this week because we've got a, a good interview and it's uh, it's 40 odd minutes, um, but very well worth listening to. Uh, we often talk to people about very specific areas and I think our guest today, Derek Murphy, is a, a very good sort of helicopter attitude uh view on working in this area i.e being somebody who creates something a creative person but with a very commercial bent to it do they use that expression in america because otherwise it's going to sound odd isn't it or a helicopter helicopter no, a commercial bent to it a commercial bent um yeah. uh, probably Maybe. not i'm okay. going to say probably not so I'll, well. I'll translate it for our american friends what james is trying to say is that he approaches things with a a commercial view he's, yes. he's always looking at things in a in a way that will enable him to make as much money as possible from the the correct the art that he puts out so. yeah so basically derek's thing is you don't have to be a starving artist if Absolutely. you box clever yes you're mixing your metaphors like oh, I love, royally today i love mixing my metaphors um good <laughs> okay look let's hear from derek we'll have a little chat uh, off the back of it i think i did more writing when I was younger and then I got into art in high school. Um, so I actually studied like art history and fine art for a while. And I was in Malta and Italy for a while painting, um, which went okay, but it was very difficult um, to have a career, like a, a full-time art, like, art career uh, was hard. So I had to learn about stuff like um, selling art, positioning, branding. And then I had to learn web design to put up a, a gallery and then um, like online marketing and stuff. So that I, I did that for a long time. I finally figured out the whole kind of point of my blog, which is creativity, is that um, if you're an artist or you're a writer and you're just trying to do the stuff that you want to do, I know it's this is what everybody tells you in the creative industry. They tell you, um, don't listen to the market, just listen to your passion and your soul and do what you want to do. Um, but what happens is 95% of creative people are making this stuff that they want to make without thinking about the market at all so they make stuff that nobody really wants or even if um even if people like it they don't know how to package it or sell it to those people in the right way because they don't know what those people want or what they're interested in um so i finally shifted once you start once you start thinking about other people and you start making things that other people can enjoy then it's not that hard to make money um with creative products it could be art or writing or whatever but i do think you need to consider who's actually going to pay for it and what types of things they pay for and why they pay for those things. Because if you know those, I mean, I think creative people can make anything and it's just a lot easier to live your life and to make things that you can sell easily. So you can spend more time making more things rather than a lot of artists or writers spend all of their time trying to market and it just doesn't work because they have stuff um, that nobody really wants. So they have to work so much harder. Yeah, and there may well be a few people, very few people uh, in in both the art and book world who get to write this rather idiosyncratic stuff that they absolutely love, and it, it's successful. But you know what? <laughs> There's thousands of people <laughs> below them who write stuff that they may think is a, a work of art that nobody's going to buy, and ultimately... I don't think we need to be too pretentious about this uh, either, Derek, do we? Because you can have... Um, you know, my other life, we do we've we've made quite a lot of commercial films, and one of them uh -huh. was we we made some films about some of the great silversmiths in uh, around the world, and particularly here in Britain, where there's a great tradition of it. And there's this amazing couple of silversmiths who work in a little workshop up in in Scotland, and they create altarpieces for the great cathedrals, and they're one of the mm -hmm. few go-to people in the world. But what do they do? 
when the bishop or whoever comes to them is they sit down and they find out what they want and, and, and they think about how what they want and what they think is going to be the right setting and how they're going to uh, right setting or how they're going to bring that to work. So they're not sitting there saying, this is what I create and you must have mm-hmm. this. They're, and they're the, I think, they're the very greatest totally... artists. Sorry? And uh, they're, saying they're very great artists. Not, uh-huh. uh, and, and... I, don't think there's, I don't think there has to be a difference between producing for yourself or producing for other people. And I think um, you can totally make things that people enjoy that's also art that you also do for yourself and you enjoy um but there's this ideology especially with writers that that's impossible and that if you write for a market then that writing quality must be worse off or not real art or not as pure as the people who are writing just for themselves um i think that's a a romantic mythology that's not it's not really true but a lot of writers still believe it and i think that's damaging for people who want to actually start making a career with the writing yeah it's certainly damaging for putting food in the cupboard isn't it so mm-hmm. let, let's uh, push that to one side and say that i think probably most people listening to this podcast don't have quite such pretensions and they are already <laughs> on the road to thinking how am i going to uh, turn the thing i love doing into something that's going to pay the bills and right. earn, earn a living and i know you're very focused on that and uh, we should also i mean i think you've been honest in one of your blogs i read some time ago that you you learned the hard way this right you, you spent probably a decade uh, as a starving yeah. artist, effectively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about that long. Um, I was lucky because I, I did my master's and my PhD in Taiwan. And now a lot of that time I was on like a national scholarship. Um, so I actually had a stipend to be going to school. And during that time, I could experiment with online business and building products and things. So um, it was actually kind of interesting. Like I, I was poor for a long time. I've been doing pretty well with book cover design the last maybe five years. But then... Like I graduated with my PhD maybe a month or two ago. Um, and then like a month after I graduated, I launched my first online course, which did really well. So it's it's kind of exciting to see. Like I don't actually plan to use my PhD in literature, but um, there's such a difference between my, my classmates who have a PhD in literature and now they have to try to find a job who they can, you know, get paid for. Because usually a PhD in literature doesn't really earn very much unless you have a, the right kind of a job. Um, but I, because I've been building my online stuff for a long time, I'm in the position to be able to put out um, new courses or new products uh, and make a lot of money really quickly, which is kind of exciting. But you, to get there, you have to be producing value and putting out a lot of free content for a long time, I think. Yes. I, I'm tempted to come up with a cruel joke about what do you say to somebody who has a PhD in literature? May I have fries with that, please? <laughs> Um, That's a pretty good joke. <laughs> pretty unfair. Um, so let's talk about specifics then, because you've now moved into, you've got quite a YouTube channel going, Derek, haven't you? I noticed you've got uh, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of views on your... Yeah, it's uh, 330,000 wow. now, which is kind of insane. Yeah. Um, it's kind of exciting. I think my YouTube videos are really crappy. <laughs> um, I was, I'm really uncomfortable on video. It took me a, like a year to even be able to put up anything and then the first year was really shitty stuff. And then I, I, I talk really fast and I think I provide a lot of value. And a lot of my stuff is um, tutorials, like how to format a book in Microsoft Word. Um, and there's just so many people searching for those things. So I get a lot of views from from those. Um, but I'm really not a, like, I'm not a video guy. I'm not a YouTube specialist. Yeah, well, you, you've done a great job. And I think it is that value thing. And as you know, this podcast, we always have, try to focus on that as well. And one of the reasons we've got you on is because you're the man who gives value and uh, gives tips. So should we start going through one or two of those areas that I know you've been instructing on and you've been coming up with uh, some plans? So we're talking uh, a little bit about list building. We, 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 it's one of the things, one of the central mantras in the SPF community is that the list mm-hmm. is uh, a central tenant of your your business, your commercial activity as a writer, and list building can take place in various ways. Uh, so what are your top tips for uh, list building? And I, I think if I can steer towards book giveaways, which you've already mentioned before in your blogs. Right. Um, I've been doing, I think people, I saw other people doing book giveaways probably before I started. And the idea is just, um, you find maybe 10 best selling books in your genre that you want your book to be associated with. And then I'll put that together and I'll do Facebook advertising for people who like those books or those authors to win those 10 books. And then I use King Sumo. Uh, there's different plugins you can use, but I think King Sumo works a little better than Rafflecopter or Gleam for getting email signups and it encourages viral sharing. So I'll, I'll do maybe $100 in Facebook advertising 
to get up to like a thousand people. And then I'll email those people and remind them that they can share to get more entries. I might remind them twice before the giveaway is over. Um, so those people will share to all of their friends. Um, so I can usually get up to several thousand subscribers on a book giveaway. And so you're really just paying for the price of those 10 books. But then I'll also do things like um, I'll share the giveaway with the authors on Twitter and tag them so they can see I'm giving away their books and they'll usually share it with their audience. And that's also a really good way just to start building relationships with those authors in your genre because they see that I'm promoting them. I might also do like a um, the top 10 best thriller books of 2016 and because I'm saying nice things about their book, those authors are likely to share it. So that gets their platform back to my platform and maybe sign up to my list for my giveaways. Um, so I've been doing, I did a lot of those. I think I built um, like 12,000 people on my list before I launched my first fiction. So that certainly helped. A lot of people, when you do book giveaways, they're not necessarily real fans. They might just be like freebie seekers, or if it gets listed on those like giveaway sites, you might get a bunch of people who aren't really interested in fiction. So you have to um, weed out a lot of the extras every month or so, but they work really well. So I've, I've done probably almost 10 of them um, in the last six months or so. Yeah, we've used uh, King Sumo as well. So people um, perhaps are familiar with it, but if you're not, it's uh, it's uh, I think it's a plugin that works with a, a few platforms. Probably WordPress is the the one we've used it yeah, for. And the WordPress. Yeah, and um, I like. If you heard of Gleam, I like Gleam also. It's a little like Rafflecopter, and it's cheaper. And Gleam is better because you can set a lot of different actions. So you can get like like my Facebook page, like my Twitter, leave a comment here. You can make them do a lot of things to earn extra entries. Okay. Um, I don't think it's as good for building an email list, so I like Kingsumo just for that. Yeah. But then if you have a list and you want to boost your the numbers on your Twitter, or your Facebook page, because I think that's important. When people see your Facebook page, they want to see you already have some followers. So it's pretty easy to run another giveaway with maybe a smaller prize if they just, you know, like some stuff or follow you. Yeah, and you've got some pretty good figures there. I think you've got nearly 13,000 uh, Twitter followers now. So that's a, that's a, a healthy yeah. indication for somebody who's blogging in a, a fairly crowded space now in the digital space, which is uh, self-publishing. Um, it's and- a nice kind of an instant um, credibility boost when people just look. If they, I think if you're an author and they see you have less than a thousand followers, I think that can be damaging. It's unfair, but it kind of it can be. So I, I mean, I would definitely work on getting those numbers above a thousand, and that's not very hard to do if you do a giveaway. Yeah, um, you've talked about permafreeze as well, and something we it's a, a philosophy that Mark certainly adheres to, and something he teaches mm-hmm. in his courses, and it's worked very well for him. There's still resistance to that and i know you've got some alternatives yeah. uh, but you are are you are you a fan of the permafree i am um my my original plan was actually to publish 10 10 books in 10 different genres um that were not full books that were kind of like the first five chapters or something i actually ended up publishing the first half of um i'm up to four novels and that's a controversial thing i know a lot of people think um, readers will be dissatisfied, or if you end on a cliffhanger, they'll be really angry. Um, I get some comments that they don't like the way I'm doing it, but the majority of readers are happy enough with the first half that they sign up to my list to get the second half when it's available. Um, so I have four books out. And the nice thing, I write young adult, and so young adult's not really a genre. So I'm actually writing, like I, I have, if you look in the free section of the young adult, if you look in paranormal romance or time travel or dystopian or Greek mythology, you'll find one of my free books in the top 20 um, of all those categories. And so once I have, I still plan to put out more perma-free books. And right now this year, I'm just kind of building my platform. Um, And the other thing was, it was actually really hard for me to finish a first full novel. I kept getting stuck. So I had a bunch of half-finished novels that were pretty decent. So I just decided to put out what I had so far um, instead of waiting. And so this past maybe six or seven months, I get about 500 downloads a day um, between my books. So that's a lot of free leads. And in the meantime, I don't have to do any marketing or promoting or advertising or anything. I just get, you know, people find my free books and they sign up to my list and that's all on autopilot. So eventually, I mean, the plan is, you know, I want to finish the full book and then finish the series. And then that's that first free half book is just a way into the series. Um, so I can't say with confidence that my way is working right now because I don't have the rest of my funnel built up. Um, but the first part's working really well. So I get a lot of signups that way. 
Yeah, well, once you've built a, a healthy list, a lot of things do normally follow naturally. Although I have to say, I haven't heard quite of that approach. So do you, you must get a few emails from people saying, where's the second half of the book? Yeah, some people are upset because they want it. They want the rest of it right away. Um, there are other authors who do serials, and there are other people who publish books that end on a cliffhanger. So mine, um, it's not that short. Like my half books are forty thousand words. One of them is seventy thousand words. So that's the first half of a full novel. So they're all like they're not short reading experiences, and that's more than enough for them. Like I introduce the world and the characters and the conflict. Um, there's the the first big development, and then you know it's enough to get them to want to read the rest. And that's, I, I think actually, if you finish a full book, they may read it and be happy with it and satisfied, but it, it didn't really impress them enough to want to buy the next one in the series. Whereas with half books, they're really into the middle of the story. And so if they, if you drop them there and they want the rest of it right away, they'll sign up to your list. Um, eventually it'll be available so they can sign up and get the rest of it right away. Right now they have to wait a long time, which sucks, but um, I, th I still think it's better this way because I g I'm getting the signups now and eventually when I finish the book, it'll be ready. It's not ideal and some people are upset, but still I'm getting more rewards for the way I'm doing it right now than I would if I had waited a year and put out full books. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how your pre-orders go because you might find mm -hmm. you get more pre-orders than, um, than others in using this particular method. Yeah, I um, I should set up the pre-orders on the next part of the books, but I'm not really confident how. I, I tried doing pre-orders last year, and um, many times I had to rush it or I missed the pre-order date. I, I lost my pre-order privileges for a year because I, I didn't publish in time. And then when I got them back, I had to really rush those books. Um, so I, I actually ended up, um, some of the people who pre-ordered my book, they got sent the, a really crappy rough draft that wasn't finished yet, and I had to apologize and you know email them and tell them that they, they need to get the clean version um, because I just didn't get the clean version uploaded fast enough. So now I'm a little uh, more wary about putting it on pre-order until I'm sure my book is ready. Yeah, yeah, no, I would definitely definitely want to make sure the book's ready to go, although it's one way of scaring mm -hmm. the living daylights out of you with a deadline. Uh, if you, you Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's been really great for... Um, I, I really need that kind of a deadline. If I have people waiting on it, and I know people have paid for it already, it's a huge productivity booster to make me do the work and get it out. Yeah. Um, so I do like doing it, but um, until I can, at least I need a clean rough draft. And if I don't have that, it's it's too early to do a pre-order. Okay, and we talked earlier then about choosing um, to create art uh, partly with a commercial head in mind. And so you've chosen YA. Was this a, res a carefully researched genre for you? Uh, as you say, it's not really a genre as such. It's a category of, of, uh -huh. of reader, isn't it, rather than a genre. Um, but did you choose it because you could write in different genres within it? Or did you choose it because this is a growth area or most likely to be commercial? Um. I like reading young adult, and part of it is because I like uh, young adults, usually fantasy or magical realism, so there's a lot of supernatural in it, but also um, there's a lot of revolution. There's a lot of, you know, a, a teen almost always is up against, you know, an evil political oligarchy, and they have to just destroy civilization and save, like, they they have to destroy everything and tear everything down and then start over, and that's, that's something I did my PhD thesis in Paradise Lost, which is kind of about um, political revolution. So I, I did a lot of research on that kind of stuff. Um, so I like that topic. And you can basically put that, you know, the political revolution in any genre. So um, yeah. I also like that young adult is very templated. So even though, even traditional best-selling young adult, they still have the same tropes. Um, and there's, there's definitely rules to the genre. So it's pretty easy for me. Um, as a new writer, I think you have to kind of learn with the training wheels on. So you... You take what, like if I read 10 books um, in a certain genre and I, they all do the same things, I know I need to put those things in my book. And then I have um, an outline and I have things that have to happen to satisfy readers. And so it makes it a lot easier to map out or plan your books. And I know they're going to be pretty successful because they do everything right. So even if I, even if the writing is not perfect, the story is not perfect, I know they'll hit all those same emotional buttons because I structured it well and I put all the stuff in that I needed to. Mm. Well, that's an interesting link between uh, 18th or 17th century, I can't remember when John Milton was, um, and young adult, <laughs> modern young adult writing, but you, you cleverly linked the two. So uh, 
I guess, as, as we often say, nothing new under the sun. His story is a story, and maybe the young adult people are the ones with the most imaginative uh, stories at the moment. Less, uh, as you say, templated, but less restricted in terms of where the story is going to go. Yeah, there's been a lot of interesting... It's funny because um, in traditional publishing, they're definitely looking for something unique but the same so they have to they take all the same young adult tropes but they have to put it in a really new world um however in self-publishing most of the bestsellers they're not that original there's still a lot of vampire romances or werewolf romances that are selling extremely well um readers still want those kind of books but traditional publishers wouldn't publish those kinds of books because they don't think they're artsy enough but they earn a lot of money so if if you're self-publishing um you can definitely just do you know, what's already popular and just try to do it a little bit different or better. Yeah. So um, you've made your choice then and you've explained that very well of young adult. Uh, and the fact that you did you decide right from the beginning to write across different genres? And, and you, you talked about the advantage of seeing your name in various top 20 lists at the moment with the giveaways. Mm -hmm. Was that a deliberate policy of you of yours? Um, kind of. I'm I'm because my background's kind of in mythology and uh, literary comparison. So I have, almost all my books are based on some specific type of mythology. So one is based on Orpheus and uh, in Greece. And we went to Bulgaria last month to kind of research all the places that Orpheus and Dionysus were. So that's like a, the background mythology. Um, it, right now we're in Ireland and I'm doing a mermaid romance. It's based on um, a lot of the Irish history and civilization, a lot of the mythology. So I'm taking kind of, myths as a backbone but then putting it into a modern setting and so my first four I think were paranormal romance with different paranormal boyfriends and then my next four are kind of all dystopian I'm really attracted to, to the dystopian genre also um, and there's time travel dystopia there's like survival dystopia there's there's different genres in there also um, but there's the very popular books uh, and categories young adult readers read a lot of books that's the other reason I like young adult is that Adult readers might read maybe a book a month, but probably not. Whereas young adult readers can read five or 10 books a month. So they just consume a lot more content. So if they like your books and they're reading like all the time and young adult is really, it's not just high school. It's um, people who are like 25 to 30 are reading a lot of young adult too, or, you know, college students. So there's a lot of older readers who are reading young adult, but they tend to be more, they, they consume more because they read faster. Um, and reading is more like a lifestyle instead of a distraction. So I think if you're writing in young adult and you have a lot of material, a lot of books, I think it's possible to sell more copies just because the readership is is consuming more. Did you say you're in Ireland at the moment? Yeah. So is this is this a writer's retreat? Yeah, kind of. Um, I had planned, we're kind of free now. So my wife and I, we just rent nice Airbnbs. And the idea was, um, often, if you rent for a month on Airbnb, you can get a bigger place at a big discount. So this place actually has three bedrooms. It's just super nice, big windows facing the, the Northern Sea. We're in Portrush. Um, it's beautiful. And the idea was that I can invite my followers to come and stay with us or I can do mini writing retreats. In the future, I'd like to. The problem with my kind of lifestyle is that we're traveling all the time and we don't really get to have a community of people. And I think it's so valuable if you're a writer, to be around other writers or to be doing writing retreats together, um, just to talk, you know, talk shop and also just to have a, kind of a supportive community because writing can be really isolating. Um, so in the future, I really want to focus on building more real-time um, events or writing retreats just to have people around me because I think that's important for me because I, I have a lot to share and offer, but also just to have, um, I think people around me is good for my own personal productivity. Yeah, you say you obviously you've um, uh, struggled a little bit to hit deadlines in the past, and you found the retreat as a, an effective way of doing that. I mean, that retreats for those. I mean, I've never been on one. I'm quite attracted to the idea. I mean, just because mm -hmm. of all the clutter in my life, and we run a couple of businesses, and I do struggle to find time during the day. And when I do find time during the day, it's in between everything else happening. And but the idea of, of trying to turn off some taps. Uh, relocate yourself somewhere. I mean, you're you're in. I think I think I've been near Port Rush in Northern Ireland, isn't it, on the north coast? Yep. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a beautiful part of uh, of of the world. They're very very green and lush. Um, mm -hmm. So so for those of us who haven't been on one, what are the specific advantages beyond perhaps being away from distraction? 
um, of writing, especially if you, you've got other people there with you? Is that, in a way, not a distraction? Um, it depends. I think it's got to be a pretty big place. This place is actually a little small for for having a, a group. Um, but normally, like if I'm writing, I just put my headphones on and I'm I can focus pretty well. Um, but we're actually next month we're renting a castle in France and it's a really big place. So we'll actually have a lot of space to kind of spread up, spread around. Um, for writing retreats, there's a book. Uh, Cal Newport has a book, something about work or do the work or something. Um, and he talks about the grand grand gesture of productivity. So he says, like, when J.K. Rowling was working on her book, she had trouble on the seventh book. So she started checking herself up into a really fancy five-star hotel just to do the writing. Um, and she ended up liking it that she did most of the book there. I think it's not only about um, unplugging from your normal life, but I think it's also committing to a certain time to focus on your writing. And if you pay to go somewhere, like if you rent a really nice hotel or an Airbnb or something, um, I think if you've spent money on it and you've devoted the time to do it, then you really feel like you have to get your money's worth. You have to do the work because otherwise you've wasted. Like right now, I feel like if I'm not working on my mermaid novel right now, I'm totally wasting this opportunity because I'm actually in Ireland. Um, and I, that's why I came here. That's why I, you know, otherwise we could have just stayed home. So um, I think investing in yourself and doing some grand gesture, some big thing um, can be productivity boosting in itself. I don't think it has to be um, a writing retreat or even with other people, but I, I think going on a vacation or definitely going to a new space. I don't know. There's something to be said for habits too. just getting, you know, finding a place in your home and having your, the cup you use and the hat you use and just, you know, planning your day the same every day so that you can get into the writing mode. There's something to be said for that too. But um, for me, I need, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably not great with productivity. I need a hard deadline and I need people waiting for me. Um, and I, I produce pretty well as long as I, I'm late and then it's okay. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned Cal Newport because he's on my list. Uh, we haven't contacted him yet because we've got quite a few interviews in the can uh, where we're sitting at the moment, but I would like to talk to him. Hence, I think deep work. Yeah, deep he's work. got some really great work. Yeah, um, and he's, he's very much one for losing distractions and being able to focus in a, in a world of distractions, which is definitely something I think a lot of people who are writing particularly those people who have yet to establish themselves as you know professional writers in the sense of, of having mm -hmm. having quit their nine to five um they need yeah. to be more disciplined than anybody else um so yeah that's definitely a good area to talk about and uh, yeah writers retreat i mean the other thing i suppose we need to be honest about and i'll talk to cal about this hopefully at some point is that different things work for different people right and mm -hmm. um uh, the retreat might work for somebody but uh, obviously I think the, the the bit you talked about that resonates a bit is is a, a gesture that prioritizes the writing because then you almost can't ignore it and you have to do some writing. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, people always ask me, like, how do you balance your time? Because a lot of my friends, um, especially in young adult, there's a lot of mothers who have two or three children and they're trying to write full time and also manage their life. Um, and they just have to juggle a lot more. I For me, I, I can't, I don't, uh, my, what do you call it? Um, I handle a lot of tasks at the same time. I have to be focused on just one thing. Right. And so I'm not very good at handling everything, but I'll, I'm pretty good at, you know, shutting everything else out and doing the thing I have to do. Um, right. and you can't, you can't do everything at once. And some things like I'm pretty bad at some of the responsibilities that I, that I need to be doing, but I try to do a little bit every day and I focus on one big thing. Um, and you know, over time you make progress. Well, famously, men can't multitask, and that's the uh, the thing. So. Is, that the, is that the thing? Apparently, apparently, women have that's my excuse. Then. Yeah, <laughs> have an advantage over us. Okay, so that's uh, that's where you are in lovely uh, Northern Ireland at the moment. Lucky you, mm -hmm. and uh, enjoying that. Now, in terms of taking us back to marketing, you've got a very good web presence. You have a great uh, blog, uh, which we should say is uh, Creative Indie without an E. Mm -hmm. well, it does have an E in the first part of Creative, but not at the end. If you're looking mm -hmm. for it. Um, and I know that you also use Facebook a lot, not just uh, advertising, which we'll talk about in a moment, but you have quite active groups of your readers, don't you? Um, yeah, I've been working on it. I made a mistake with my um, with my fiction. I think groups work a lot better than pages, and most authors will set up an author page. 
Um, I don't think pages have as much reach or get as much engagement as groups. And so I'm like my, my fiction um, page has three or 4,000 likes on it, but it doesn't get super engagement. Although I, a lot of that's just my fault because I don't steer the engagement like I should. Um, in the most recent book giveaway I'm doing, I said, I'll give some um, runner up prizes if you just comment on the Facebook post with your top three, the books you wanna win. And so I've had like a hundred comments on that. So if you do that kind of stuff and get more comments, your your pages, your, your posts will have more reach. Um, but for groups, the other, the one that I'm, I've done pretty well um, because I knew I wanted to be writing in young adult and because I don't have any platform, um, I'm not a fiction or I haven't been a fiction writer. So people don't know me in the young adult fiction space. Um, so I started doing these book giveaways and emailing or, or telling the authors about them. And then I started a group for young adult authors, which is the Young Adult Authors Alliance. And so when I meet or I reach out to a new young adult, you know, author friend that I want in my group, I'll invite them to come into my group. Um, and we actually have a lot of, it's kind of, I mean, some people in my group say that we're too focused on the sales because I, we really like talking about when, it, when one of our members gets a New York Times bestseller or a USA Today bestseller, we like to celebrate that. And so I have some people in the group who write maybe um, literary fiction and they're not as, you know, they're, they're not going to be bestsellers because they're writing in more limited genres. They don't have as big of a readership. Um, so I think we focus in my group, we focus less on like the, the art of writing and more on the marketing and the, you know, building a platform. Um, but it's really helpful because now that group has almost a thousand members. So when I want to do any group promotion, um, I try to support them as much as I can. And so I'm always providing value to all of these authors who have their own platforms and their own readerships. And I think, you know, it, long term that will help me out a lot in my own fiction, just because um, I'll have spent, you know, years supporting other writers in my genre. And so when I ask for help, if I ask for help, uh, it, I'll have a lot of authors who will be happy to share me with their audience. So you, are we joking about not being able to multitask just now, but actually you do have quite a broad spectrum of, of work. Um, you know, you talk about the covers and your, your writing and your blog and so on. In terms mm -hmm. of your revenue streams and where you see yourself in the future, what are you working on in terms of, of revenue? Is it primarily the books that will be your focus? Um, I have several different. I have been doing uh, – services for a long time. So I was doing book editing and then I started book cover design. And the problem with services is that it's it's limited. So I, I can only do so many covers a month. And what actually happens is I end up being like the writing coach or the publishing coach. So they pay me one time for a, a cover, but then I might be still giving them advice three months later. And so if I have, you know, 10 or 20 authors a month, um, after a couple of years, I have hundreds of authors asking me questions all the time. And because I put out so much free content online, I get a lot of people asking me questions or asking me about my free tools or, you know, they had a problem with my free tools. Um, so a lot of my time is actually just spent helping people, which I, I love to do, but I also need to stop because it's it's so consuming and it's really stressful to have so many people um, trying to, to ask you questions. So what I've been trying to pivot towards uh, is courses because with the course, I can just, you know, put out a video and say, here's my video course, here's my free uh, tutorials or templates. You can you know, you don't need to ask me any questions because you can just go to my blog post here. So I've been putting out a lot of resources like that. Um, and I actually get a lot of signups for, I have a, a site that's for book cover design templates and I have a site that's for book formatting templates. And so I actually get probably 50 signups a day from those sites and I don't do anything with them very well. I've kind of tried to sell um, design templates, but that's, it's hit or miss. But if I fix that funnel a little bit better, um, I would provide a lot of value. I would help answer all their questions. And then in a few weeks, I would offer them my course about publishing or book marketing. And uh, if I could get, you know, one or two sales a day, then that would be enough of an income that I could focus on writing fiction full time. I think fiction can be very profitable. I'm not there yet because I've been putting out free books to build my platform. Um, and I haven't, because I'm still kind of working, I haven't really been able to write as much as I would have liked to this year. But I was up to, I was making two or 3,000 a month um, the first couple months after I started publishing fiction. And I don't think that would have lasted because I think when you launch a book, the, your, your rank will start dropping. Um, but now that I have the free books, when I start putting out full books and when I start putting out 
you know, a whole series. I sh I'd like to have like 10 three book series in the next three or four years. So when I can get to that point, I think my income will be a lot more substantial. And the nice thing is that that's scalable. So with those kind of things, with the courses or the books, um, I can double my traffic and double my income. Whereas before I could double my traffic and I just couldn't handle more work. So I would have to turn clients away and say, I'm too busy. Yeah. Well, you're talking to somebody who helped build a service uh, business in video production and knows all about that lack of scalability mm -hmm. and the difficulty of that. Um, so, yes, we've made a similar move uh, to you, having fished around for something that's going to work and, and be scalable and be of value to people uh, in what we've mm -hmm. created here. Um, so the last area I want to talk about, I don't think we've mentioned yet that you also have an editing uh, service. Is that the book Butchers? That's right. The book butchers. Um, I started an editing service. It was kind of my first online business. Um, and then I learned a lot about branding and I started working with authors. So I wanted to make a new editing service that was more author specific. Um, and I, I think it's got really nice branding. So I think people like it because the branding is really good. It's brutal. Um, I don't do editing myself anymore. I was excited about the idea and I, I designed the site. Um, I think it's very good branding. I think I try to look for experienced editors who have really good credentials. Um, I think editors don't really get paid as much as they should. And I know from, I know because I've edited a lot of books, how, how much time editing takes. Um, and a lot of people will come into editing and they'll start at a lower price. Um, but I was basically, because I don't do editing, I just, I wanted a platform where I could put some really high quality editors and authors could find those editors easily. Um, most of the time it works really well. I don't really make money from it, but um, most we, we get, I don't know, probably five or 10 clients a month and they're happy. So we're helping as much as we can. Well, I love the branding of, um, uh, of the, uh, the book butchers. Uh, it is exactly as you might think it is. And uh, I think even down to the, um, I'm just trying to scroll down there, yeah, the pricing, which is the quick kill, extra bloody or the perfect murder, if you want to go... Uh, and actually, unusually for a, uh, an editing service, at uh, right on the front there is the price per word that you're going to pay and the type of um, service you're going to get for that. So that's a really nice setup and a good place for you to plan at an early stage. Yeah, I don't really like um, if you have to email to ask how much something costs. I just think that takes an extra amount of time for both people, for the author and also for me, because I'd have to reply to every inquiry. Um, and the way it's set up is that, you know, they'll submit a sample and some of the editors, if they want to work on the project, they'll do a sample edit. And then if it's a good match, the author chooses the editor. So most of the time, um, because they've tested each other out, it tends to work out pretty well. Um, whereas most independent editor sites, like if you hired any other editing company, you're really just working with one person. And I think not every editor is, is equipped to handle every kind of fiction or nonfiction, I think people definitely have their strengths. So this way it kind of tends to work out that people who are really good at one type of a project will usually get those those projects. Yeah, and that's uh, it's a nice way of doing it as well because people often um, uh, try to work out you know whether they need a structural editor, proof editor and so on and then you've got the options there and, and the very clear prices uh, and I think it makes, I think your, your, what is it called again, the quick kill. I think that mm -hmm. puts uh, you know professional editing very much in reach of people, so particularly for starting out at the beginning. Although I'd always say, and I'm sure you'd agree with this, that actually splashing out more and editing is probably the best money, that and the cover, the best money you're going to spend at an early stage of your writing career, particularly to, to try and get a structural edit on uh, somebody's going Yeah, I've actually, um, it's controversial, but I don't always recommend book editing. And a lot of people get upset about that. Um, and the only reason is, I don't think it's fair to say that only authors who have a certain budget are allowed to publish their fiction. That's what a lot of people say. They say you shouldn't publish at all unless you can afford an editor. And a lot of writers don't have a disposable income of, you know, $5,000 for book cover and for editing and for everything else. So I think if you can't afford it, you should still be able to do the best you can and afford whatever you can and put your work out there um, and reach readers. So I, I think, of course, it's a great, if you have the money, it's, it's great for your writing, especially because when you start writing, if you have a, a really good editor, they'll identify um, writing common flaws that you can get better at. But on the other hand, I think, especially for fiction, story always matters over everything else. A lot of writers, um, they might pay for editing and get a really clean manuscript, but the story doesn't satisfy readers. So that's not going to be a successful project. And I think with a story, um, my favorite books are plot perfect story grid and story fix 
And I recommend those three all the time just because they really focus on the fundamentals of, of plotting fiction. Um, and I think if you plot your story really, really well and you have decent writing, people will, I mean, you can't, you can't have a lot of typos or grammar mistakes in your book. If you have too many of the readers are going to drop you, but um, as long as you, you know, you have a handful in a huge manuscript, most readers will over readers will overlook it as long as the story is good. Um, so I, I, th I definitely think focus on the story first, because that's the main problem uh, most writers have is their story just doesn't satisfy readers. Hmm. But then, yeah, if you can afford it, um, editing is, is very valuable. Yeah. Well, that's great, Derek. And you've mentioned quite a few uh, resources there. We'll make sure they're all in the show notes here. Plot Perfect. I've just added that to my list <laughs> as somebody who uh, worries a lot about the story and the plot um, before it goes off to an editor. That'd be a one from... Yeah, the other one, Story Grid, is really interesting because it's, I think it's, uh, I want to say Sean Coyne, but I'm not sure if that's the right name. It's Stephen Pressfield's editor. And it's really fascinating because Stephen Pressfield has always been about um, do the do the art and just, you know, do the art and don't worry about work or the how don't worry about the reception um and then it's really funny because sean coin put out story grid that's more about the editor basically the artist produces this crazy work that has no market and the editor's job is to turn it into a product that people will buy um but then more recently stephen pressfield has started his most recent little book is like nobody gives a shit about your work i think that's the title of his book <laughs> which is really surprising um and he's I think he's becoming more aware that you do have to make stuff that people give a shit about because otherwise you're not going to earn any money and you don't really deserve to earn any money if you're making something that nobody cares about. Yeah. Sean Coyne's uh, uh, story grid comes up from time to time as well. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. definitely one well referenced. Well, I'm jealous that you're uh, enjoying yourself in uh, in Ireland. Although I have to say, you're yeah. on the uh, you're on the Atlantic coast there, and you probably get battered from time to time by the wind. Have you had some good weather since you've been there? It's been sunny sometimes. It's it's been rainy and windy a lot too, um, but that's fine. My, it's definitely helpful for my novel because my novel is really kind of a dark, um, slow, almost thriller. So there's a lot of you know dark clouds and rain and wind and stuff. So that's good. I think it's it, it's good. Yeah, well, that's definitely something that um, the United Kingdom and, and Ireland can provide for you, which is <laughs> weather so bad that you have to just be in and write. So that's awesome. Yeah, maybe we'll stay. We might come back. So that was Derek. Uh, yeah, his creativeindie.com is his uh, little bit of real estate on the internet. And um, uh, Derek is, yeah, I, I really liked the idea that there's, there's, you don't have to sit around saying, if only people appreciated me as an artist and then I'd be wealthy. You have to think, well, how do I make what I do and I want to do commercially successful? And you take the positive steps to make that happen. Yeah, and we've said this hundreds of times. It, it, success isn't going to magically fall into your lap as soon as you put your first book out there you need to work very hard almost everyone will need to work very hard some people might may, may, may strike it lucky but the odds of that are really long um the harder you work i think there's probably a direct correlation with the odds of, of being successful and that might mean you need to write three or four books it might mean that you need to engage in the marketing activities that we often talk about on the podcast or it might mean you've got to do both of those things and a lot more on top of that make sacrifices work hard get up early maybe work over your lunch break whatever um, but the the harder you work the better your chances of of making a successful career um, are and also of course i mean that 10 20 years ago it wouldn't have mattered how hard you worked you, you would still have been dependent upon gatekeepers agents publishers um, marketing departments cover designers that these kinds of people actually would would hold the keys to success and um, you'd be you would require an element of luck to, to get through that that process it's not the case these days it is as I, I probably bore people to death about this but it's a golden age now to be a writer and the the odds of being successful as as Derek um, mentions are have never been better than they are right now yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, Derek covers a lot of the areas. We've had a lot of the areas that we cover actually at creativeindie.com, but I like a lot of the little blog posts he has, special areas of just um, uh, making sure that you're as finely tuned to the market as possible, whether that's the blurb and the description, whether that's the particular advertising and marketing that you do. So a useful site and a great guy as well. I should apologize. I think we did that interview quite a long time ago for Derek. I know some podcasts take like a year before they produce it. We're normally... Uh, contemporaneous 
to use a really posh word. Um, but uh, yeah, we did, I spoke to Derek some time ago, but it's great to get that uh, at that aired. Good. Okay, quick reminder that you can get the back catalogue of uh, podcasts from Self Publishing Formula. Just simply go to iTunes or Stitch or wherever it is you normally pick up the podcast. You can download the app from the App Store or on the Google Play Store. Uh, just search for Mark Dawson's Self Publishing Formula. And you can get a book specially designed for people who find they're getting value from the podcast, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash vault, V-A-U-L-T, and you will find uh, the previous episodes that are in there searchable in a text-based form, which is useful. Indeed, and if you want to support us and help us to uh, continue putting this podcast out, then you can become a Patreon supporter at patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast and three levels of support one two or three dollars um per podcast um so you know as, as little as four dollars a month and for that you can be entered into um, a contest to win our courses uh, you'll get our books ahead of everybody else um get a chance to to get one of these uh, fine mugs and um plenty of other benefits to uh to be picked up for those who, who support us and of course we'll also give you a shout out on the show as well yeah absolutely okay that's it thank you very much indeed for listening hope you're enjoying a summer in the northern hemisphere or not shivering too much in the south and we'll be with you again next week bye bye you've been listening to the self-publishing formula podcast visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information show notes and links on today's topics You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.